So, um, Paolo and I have decided that he will start with a very interesting short story of what happens with land in, uh, in a certain part of Peru. And I think it's an excellent way of entering into the questions uh, we want to discuss. Okay, thank you, Christine. Um, yes, as a, let's say, as a stimulus, as an input, we thought about this uh, very uh, little story around which I have been working uh, for the past months, let's say. So this is uh, a map uh, of uh, a state of emergency uh, which uh, was declared by the former president of Peru, Alan Garcia, in 2009. Uh, as you know, you, you cannot see the lines of the map of Peru, but uh, more or less uh, the lines of uh, the state of emergency cover the entire Amazon, the entire Amazon that belongs to Peruvian sovereignty. And this state of emergency was declared because there were several protests happening throughout the Amazon, including uh, many uh, uh, blockings of roads, uh, occupations of uh, oil uh, facilities, uh, mining sites, um, uh, organized by the indigenous movement of Peru. And they were protests mainly uh, about the introduction of a new law, a new forest law. Uh, this forest law, what it would do, would potentially change every land in Peru that is defined as forest land, uh, which is part of the public heritage of the country. So every forest land in Peru is defined as uh, belonging to the public her heritage of the country, therefore it cannot be privatized. So this, this new law, this new forest law, would potentially change the legal status of forest lands and would open up those lands to privatization. Now, what is interesting is that in the case of Peru, the kind of legal definition of what is a forest land overlaps uh, with the natural definition of what is a forest land. And the, the, the kind of uh, division between the legal and the natural is somehow not uh, precisely uh, established, or they kind of overlap each other. This is the ecological map of Peru. It was elaborated for the first time in early 50s, and it's based on a methodology of, uh, of a, a climate scientist, if you want to say like this, called Leslie Holdridge, it's called the Holdridge Model. Uh, and while he was working for the Organization of the American States, uh, he had a, a kind of laboratory in Puerto Rico, and he developed this model to locate uh, what he could call uh, ecological zones, to map ecological zones based on uh, data as, for example, temperature, precipitation, evaporation uh, uh, and other uh, uh, data that he could get and he could make this kind of ecological maps uh, really um, fast and somehow precise. So this is uh, on, the, on the top right corner, you see the so-called Holdridge model of life zone systems, uh, which he developed. And based on that chart, you can somehow map the ecological zones of a country. And this was happening in uh, early 50s, I would say. No? At this time, uh, and later on, the um, uh, Organization for the American States were somehow uh, very much related to uh, the kind of Cold War context in, in, in the sense that uh, was a kind of rush for resources. So this map would allow for you to identify kind of land potential and, and plan to access those lands. As you can see, Peru uh, has a kind of uh, huge biodiversity, so all these kind of different uh, color patterns are related to uh, different uh, uh, zones of life, as Holdrich called it. But what is interesting is that out of this map, out of this ecological map, they designed a new map which is called uh, Land Use Potential. 
right? So based on a kind of ecological definition of uh, the life zone systems, they say, well, this land has more potential for this type of economic act activity. And it was very much a kind of economic driven uh, cartography to a large extent. And this is the map of land use uh, of Peru, meaning uh, if you have a, a forest land, you have potential to forest activities, such as wood, for example. If you have a land which has potential for ag agriculture, so this land should be used for agriculture. Now, what's interesting is that this ecological map was translated into law. In 75, there is a government in Peru that say every land for you locate, for you to identify what is the potential and what is the type of activity that you can conduct in this land, you have to define according to the Holdrich model, which is somehow based on a kind of ecological vision. So it's somehow as if the kind of nature which was uh, identified by the Holdrich model was transcribed into law. Now, if you analyze this map the way it is, uh, basically, let's say there are several types of land, no? So it's a kind of taxonomy of land. Uh, but there is a major division, which is agriculture and forest, right? There is land that can be used for agriculture in different degrees of intensity, and there is land which can be used for forest, but uh, it's not agricultural land. So this is, it's, it's a bit more complicated, but let's stick to this, to this, um, uh, division which is important because precisely the law uh, against which people were protesting uh, was supposed to re-legislate the forest land. So if you do an analysis, for example, here I'm taking out in black every uh, land which is defined as forest. Different also uh, uh, qualities of forest, but all forest lands. So this is uh, the area which is defined as forest by Peru. I cannot uh, see the percentage, but as you can see, it's a large part of the country because they have a huge size of the Amazon and some forest also in the coast. If you take the protected areas uh, in the indigenous land, this is the area or the land would, which would be potentially re-legislate. Now, if you overlap the, the kind of political line of CH with, uh, with the land that would be potentially, let's say, enclosed, that it would pass through this process of enclosure, right, which was somehow a kind of common land and would potentially be privatized, they kind of overlap. And I think this is interesting insofar as there is a suspension of civil liberties which comes together with a process of privatization, that is, of somehow a kind of expropriation of land, right? But there is a, a kind of uh, specificity to this uh, law uh, which I think is interesting. It was not all the land, all the forest land, that suddenly, not all this territory would be suddenly privatized. But there was a, a kind of detail which is important. Just the land without forest would be open for privatization and potentially to become agricultural land. So it's a kind of deforestated forest land that would change its legal status. So, for example, if you concentrate on that region, which is a region of the Amazon, which is like this. So basically, what people who were uh, uh, um, uh, protesting this law was saying that uh, deforestation would, be, would turn into the very means to create private property, right? So destruction would be uh, the very medium of expropriating or appropriating or enclosure, enclosing land. But what is interesting is that the people who were protesting, they said, well, the forest cover, the surface, cannot be used as a base to define the forest. But in fact, you have to look to the soil. So they kind of came back to the kind of natural definition which is used in Holdridge's model 
which is not based only on the surface, but rather based on the soil, to claim that this land should, be, uh, should stay as a forest. So I think the question here is, is what, what in fact defines a forest? And how this new forest land would somehow uh, reshape a kind of natural definition insofar as this forest or this deforestated forest would cease, would, would, would not be a forest no longer. So there is a kind of uh, overlapping between the way in which uh, law uh, is somehow reshaping uh, a nature or opening up a kind of possibility for uh, redefining a kind of natural environment. And on the other side, uh, the scientists, uh, scientists and lawyers who are saying, uh, in fact, uh, forest cover doesn't define what is a natural forest. You have to look to the soil to, uh, to define this ecology, right? It's not only the surface, but it's a, header, a kind of complex ecology which defines a forest, which ultimately can be characterized by uh, the quality of its soil. So somehow they were using a kind of natural definition or ecological definition of the forest uh, in order to uh, preserve a certain type of law, uh, the, the, the old forest law, which uh, would allow to keep those areas as uh, a common land, mm. let's say. Yes, uh, I found this story very interesting. I'm going to say s a, a few things in German too, because it's just uh, you, you know the things you want to say more easily in your own native language. But I found this um, example very interesting because it reminded me of what happened in the 17th, 18th century in Europe. And this was described beautifully by Karl Polanyi in The Great Transformation, The History of the Industrialization, which he describes in this book. Und in diesem Buch, jetzt wechsle ich auf Deutsch, auf, ja, auf Deutsch. And I would change into German. Und in diesem Buch beschreibt in this er book, also, wie he describes the gradual change of the soil. The, the land was used by everyone, was communal land, and everyone had to had the right to use the soil as pasture for their animals or grow crops. And all of a sudden, there were enclosures and the land was privatized. That was the very moment where in Europe the land was not only privatized and thus taken away from the public, but the land became a commodity at that moment in time. And Polanyi says that was the most stupid thing that our ancestors could ever have done because the land, the land until then was always seen as a community Mm, ownership thing, and it was suddenly privatized, was turned into a kind of mobile property. And then he also said, all of a sudden, this commodity uh, meant that also labor became a commodity. And Karl Marx has described that beautifully as well. And at that very moment in time, many things start changing. The boundaries, the limits start to change. The law starts changing too. And the law starts intervening into ownership relationships, the way in which nature is being thought. And there was also deforestation processes. And at the same time, agricultural areas were created and they were handed over to private owners who could use them in order to make a profit. And generally, let me also say here, Gary talked about human beings generally defining themselves as human beings because they have certain implements, instruments, because human beings can use technology, can use tools. One of the first tools being the plow, the spade. Today we have electronic devices and huge machines that we can use to to work in agriculture. And one of the most important processes, so to say, was money. Money is the prosthesis, the tool, the implement that makes it possible to change the use of land. Land seemed to be 
always something for the community. Nobody had the right to uh, expropriate land. Of course, the king owned the land, but he was only the representative figure for communal ownership. He wasn't the real fiscal owner of the land. And also the land given to the uh, nobility was delegated land and was used by everyone. And with the beginning of industrialization, there was true privatization. That was a very deep intervention. And I may also add that this intervention takes place in peril to the emergence of paper money and in peril to the first ability of man to fly. Montgolfier in 1793 was uh, experimenting and all of a sudden it was possible for man to look onto the land from above and that was usually a view that was reserved to God and all of a sudden this view was possible for men as well and that made it easier to sort of uh, hand over the land to private owners. I think your stories describes once again what has happened a long time ago, say 150 or 200 years ago in Europe. Yes, uh, and, and it's interesting because uh, the, the great enclosures, right, the great enclosures, the, uh, the great erasure of, um, of common lands, um, comes together at this moment uh, when perhaps the Anthropocene is, is being created. You know? So uh, if we date the Anthropocene uh, together with um, the birth of uh, industrialization, we also have to consider that this came uh, in parallel with this great process of, uh, of, of enclosure. So maybe I would ask you, uh, uh, how, how would you connect, let's say, this aspect of privatization of land with uh, the Anthropocene, if that's possible at all, and if, if, and if there is a, a connection in that process which, by which land at a massive scale starts to turn into private property, uh, which is to say you are somehow changing a certain type of political ecology. It's not only a question of ownership, but it's also a question of managing resources, of the way you organize socially in relation to the forest itself, in relation to land. So it's not only a question of, uh, of um, ownership, as I was saying, but actually a kind of completely transformation of uh, an ecology, but not only an ecology, a political ecology in that sense. And so my question perhaps to you is how, how could we relate the the, the turning of the land uh, uh, into a commodity uh, in a massive global scale that since industrialization has happened and, and later on uh, throughout the, the third world uh, with the, the, the coming of the Anthropocene. Polanyi says it was the most stupid thing to do because land does not only mean property and the ability to grow the land or have horses on the land or whatever other animals. Land is always tied to relationships, whole professions, vocations, social relationships between families and villages, settlements. Land, the soil, is much more than just uh, a physical entity. Land is where people are anchored. Land is where people derive rights. And the French Revolution was very clever. The French revolutionaries invented the assignates. That's paper money, paper money that was spent was uh, given to people in order to defend the revolution against um, foreign forces. And so they handed out assignates, that is to say paper money, and that was covered uh, by the land uh, which was confiscated, confiscated from the church. One fifth of all the land was owned by the church in France and it was then uh, taken away from the church, was confiscated. 
And uh, on the basis of this land, which was used as security, they issued uh, paper money, but they issued too much, and so the money uh, was devalued. But the French revolutionaries were very clever. They created a law that is still in force. And it says every man, today it's every person, has the right to go hunting even though the land as such is owned by somebody else. So the right to go out into the forest to collect mushrooms or go hunting was a right and is a right still that uh, can be claimed by every French citizen. If you go to France today and uh, if somebody tells you, well, go away from here, you will hear that the French citizens immediately claimed their right to use the forest. But it was a very clever ruse of the French Revolution to keep this right, because it was still a reminiscence of the old communal land. And that shows once again that the civil rights are very closely tied to the land. And here I also think it's a factor that plays an important role here. Absolutely. Um, I think what is fascinating in this case is that uh, somehow a kind of reframing of, of what would be this nature in a certain way that was going through this law uh, was uh, attached with uh, uh, the expropriation of political rights. Uh, and I was very touched by what you say, you know, that uh, quote in Poland, you know, that land is something from which you, you draw rights, right? It's, it's the kind of base of a certain types of rights, right? And, and, and this reminds me uh, a book which I, I, I have been reading more than once uh, by Peter Linenbaum, uh, which is called the, the, Ca the Magna Carta Manifesto, Commons for All. And in this book, he is going to uh, recuperate the, the Magna Carta, which was passed uh, uh, in medieval England, uh, 13th century. And, and this, this, this chart uh, was uh, perhaps one of the first, let's say, human rights documents uh, in, in the history of humanity, because it aims to protect uh, the, the rights of the citizens in relation to sovereign power, right? You have the right for a fair trial you cannot go to prison without a fair trial. And all these uh, um, uh, other rights that, that, that derive, other political and civil rights that derive from this chart. And then he said, well, but you know, you have to go back to, this, to, the, to the Magna Carta because it was not the only document created at this moment. In fact, there was the chart of the forest. There was the Magna Carta and the chart of the forest. And the chart of the forest uh, was to protect the rights of communing, of, of the commons. It's to protect the rights for you to get your wood, to get your energy. No, this was, was, was a question of energy, right? For you to, to warm yourself. It's, it's uh, when uh, you have, uh, there is a certain climate event and you could not uh, get as many crops that, as you should. You have the forest as a safety net for your subsistence. Right, so what he's saying is that somehow, since the, the, the Magna Carta and, and the chart of the force, they were connected together, we somehow forgot the, the chart of the force, or let's say the law of the forest, we somehow forgot this, and our notions of rights became very much based on, on a notion, let's say, of the individual vis-a-vis -vis, um, sovereignty in a certain way, right? The way in which we understand civil and political rights. But he's saying, well, we have to go back to this idea of the law of the forest in a certain way because our liberties, our political liberties, they are connected to land, to our right to access land. And I think in that way, uh, what we see today is very much connected to this because, uh, uh, and in the case of Peru, very, very much exemplary of this because uh, the expropriation of a certain type of, of, of land uh, or, or the right of communing, if you want, uh, is immediately connected with uh, a certain uh, violation of your uh, political rights, meaning uh, 
expropriation and, 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 and suspension of, uh, of political rights come hand in hand. And, and, and Peter Linenbaugh says uh, uh, a very nice phrase which I have here, so perhaps I'm going to read so I can quote it uh, on the right. Uh, it's here. He says, the robbery, the robbery of the honey and the robbery of our, of our safety, the robbery of communing and the taking of liberties have gone hand in hand. And to a large extent, I think this is, this is a process that, that is happening in a massive scale today. After the financial crisis, what we saw, although we are discussing you know, the Anthropocene, I think uh, you know, the, 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 the big companies, the, the, the big agricultural companies, the big mining companies, they, they are continually, continuously producing the Anthropocene. After, after the financial crisis, when, let's say, capitalism realized uh, that it needs matter again, no, somehow, right? Financial capitalism meltdown, but so there was a kind of land rush uh, in Africa, uh, in Latin America, several uh, uh, multi multinational companies trying to grab land or to secure land, to secure resources, insofar as resources are going scarce, so we have to secure, so kind of buying land because they know that's going to be a, or, or some other nations buying land because they know they're going to lack food supply in the future. And in the case of Peru particularly, and Peru has been, uh, you know, uh, for the last years, the, this is the only, only the beginning of the state of emergency. The, the, there were several moments in which states of emergency have been declared, and most of them are associated with resources. Most, if not all of them. Uh, especially mining in Peru, because Peru is very rich on, 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 on uh, mineral resources. And, and it's interesting because this, this expropriation of, of you uh, access this land or this uh, safety net, no? he used this, this word, no? safety net, uh, happens simultaneously uh, with that moment when you became, uh, let's say, uh, a being without a property, right? You are, you are the one who needs to have a property, but you don't have, so you have to sell your workforce. This is the process of enclosure, right? You, you, you are landless, and the only thing you have is your, it's your energy, right? Labor. And that's what you have to sell in the market. And the massive urbanization that the enclosure has generated uh, is, is also uh, one of the great sources of... Uh, uh, the Anthropocene of the radical transformation of, uh, of the environment in so far as our cities have grown enormously. No? And this process uh, uh, somehow continues in a certain way. And, and to become uh, a landless uh, 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 labor, it's also uh, a worker, it's also um, when your when your when your safety, uh, which the let's say the forest provides in in a, in a time of bad harvest, for example, you don't have the safety net network anymore. So and then you have to rely on a series of other forms of security, which include uh, uh, insurance uh, and a series of of uh, other kind of private means by which you have to try to uh, secure life if you don't have, or either some sort of uh, a state, uh, a, a, a welfare state for mm -hmm. this. And so I think this, this, this is a, a question which is somehow contemporary, because uh, one, of the, one of the main, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, struggles uh, today, I think, uh, from America, from Latin America, is to keep people on the land, right? to reverse that process somehow, or uh, because our cities have grown to a certain size that they are incapable of, of being uh, uh, self-sustained in a certain mm. way. So I think the question of land, we, we, we had this idea no, uh, at, a, at a certain moment, I think, that uh, urbanization, you know, like the, the whole uh, uh, world is urbanized in a certain way. The, 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 the countryside is something that, you know... So it's vacation. No yeah. But I think it's actually the opposite now. We have to look uh, 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 our societies, urban societies, from a territorial perspective, always. 
no, from uh, a relation where the food is produced, how the food gets in, how is the land attached to the city uh, a, a connected, mm -hmm. managed. So I think uh, we are kind of uh, uh, shifting also our perception of, of this process and kind of, let's say, coming back to the question of land as, as so well described by Polan in a certain yeah. way. Well, I think what we can see definitely is the close tie between the question of land and the question of human existence. I mean, uh, human rights, political freedoms and other things are closely tied to land. And insofar, this question rightly concerns also the future of human existence. Paolo has just uh, talked about insurance. Europe at uh, that time has developed, the, the pension system has developed welfare states in order to mitigate the consequences of industrialization, the disasters of, mid, of uh, industrialization. We succeeded in Europe in doing that, at least partly, but as a consequence, human beings became more and more involved Involved into the uh, monetized system and the human body became also an entity that has a certain value either it was devalued in uh, like in the favelas where the human body is worth nothing on the other hand Austrian sciences scientists have also evaluated certain damage cases uh, where somebody lost a hand or an eye and went to court to get compensation or the, the leg was broken, whatever, and those uh, damage cases were decided by courts and scientists then have calculated, have evaluated that and have found out that in Germany and in Austria, on average, uh, a body part is worth 1.7 million uh, euros where uh, damages paid to men were much higher than to women. So compensation is not uh, equitable, is not the same for the two sexes, and it's not the same level of compensation that you get when you are right compared to when, when, when you're rich compared to when you are poor. But this kind of monetization, the fact that people became landless and had to migrate uh, to the cities, to the slums on the outskirts, of course, those bodies are much were less worth in this kind of monetarized world compared to the bodies of uh, people living in the rich industrialized countries. That shows that rightlessness ex develops before the law, and even an individual physical body has no significance or has much less significance in such a monetized uh, system. So this kind of gap that we see t t today between the rich and the poor repeats itself again when you calculate the value that individual bodies have. Perhaps to pick up on this idea of, uh, let's say, the completely privatization of life as the ultimate realm of capitalist appropriation in a certain way. And to revert this uh, a little bit, um, I've been doing uh, some work in Ecuador. And, and uh, in Ecuador, they, they passed a new constitution. This was 2007 if I remember it correctly, in which they, they, they grant uh, rights, the kind of similar rights to the human, they grant to nature. And this was something in my work I call non-human rights. How, how are we going to think non-human rights? And this process of thinking about this came, in fact, after, let's say, the, the neoliberal decade, no? in which there was a, a violent process of privatization if you want, land privatization and other resources uh, privatization. And uh, reflecting upon this, this new constitutionalism, and it's interesting because the constitution is that which, you know, you, let's say, constitute a, a, a polity, right? You know, the kind of refundation of the equatorial state in a certain way. We have to draft a new constitution in order to establish new rights because uh, the laws that we have do not fulfill. Uh, our expectations as a polity, right? So they kind of 
uh, redo the constitution, but inside this constitution or this 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 polity, this this collective uh, uh, nature is part of this. No, it it becomes uh, let's say a subject in a certain way, mm. and and it's interesting to see that uh, our let's say our usual relation uh, with with nature itself is very much based on on uh, this kind of objectification of nature right yeah. and this is totally inscribed in law uh, uh, uh. so from the point of view of law there is no other space for the environment besides that of being an object of appropriation well you can say this can be public land this can be a private land but ultimately the kind of epistemic frame is nature as an object, right? So they kind of like trying to, to shift this, also, that is to say, well, no, in fact, we have to consider a form of life, we have to have a kind of ethics of life, or, or towards life otherwise than human, that cannot be considered as that which is, can be appropriated, can be turned into a uh, private property, right? Because insofar as you have rights, you became a kind of subject-like entity, uh, you somehow, uh, you cannot be turned into an object of appropriation. There is, there is a kind of noise there. But what you're saying to me is in fact that, you know, when they're trying to protect nature, of becoming nature, becoming a subject, humanity, the, the, the human body is becoming totally uh, a form of object of appropriation. Uh, which is which somehow uh, the kind of uh, as as if capitalism was much beyond already, you know. So perhaps I I don't know how how would you 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 see this if you would see this as a form of uh, in your research around money and the, the kind of commodification of life itself, uh, if you'd see any sort of potential in this in this uh, uh, attempt to let's say reframe nature. Uh, through a sort of legal code or any sort of potential in legal codes in redefining or, or re, uh, yes, reframing the way uh, in, through which we'll deal uh, with the world mm -hmm. otherwise mm -hmm. than, than a human world. Yeah, well, I indeed um, would be very hopeful if we had a charter which protects nature. But I also think that capitalism is much faster than all possible forms of protection. And biocapitalism claims that the things that we destroy, the forests, we're going to make it more beautiful. We're going to introduce new plants and everything will be nicer, the soil will be more fertile, the trees will be bigger, all kinds of fantasies that you could even see in the 17th century in Francis Bacon when he had his scientific utopia of uh, Nova Atlantis. So biocapitalism is already there to say no, you don't have to protect nature. We are going to make it better. We are going to make nature better than it ever was before. But that also will have repercussions on humans as well. Men can store their semen in uh, the semen banks and sperm banks, and there are also uh, databases on the number of uh, children that somebody has uh, conceived because of the sperms donated. And if I, as a woman uh, in Romania, uh, donate uh, uh, an egg, I can get 300 euros. And uh, the same uh, thing will cost $5,000 uh, in the US. So the human body becomes a commodity as well. It's going to be capitalized. And the Supreme Court of California recently decided, that was a couple of years ago, there was a case, a dispute between a woman who had given birth uh, to a uh, child for another woman. Uh, she was uh, hired by people to give birth to the child. And of course, the um, 
and she didn't want to give away this child. And the Supreme Court decided the child is a natural child of the parents who had uh, paid this woman, the surrogate mother, to give birth of it. So the logical consequence is that money can make children. Here we have also the same kind of thing done to humans that is done by biocapitalism to nature. And biocapitalism offers us a kind of opportunity to protect the helpless nature. But biocapitalism says, well, we cannot only restore the nature, we can even restore the human body, perfect it, make it better. And high, a high-tech child where the ovulum and the sperm is donated and where you have a surrogate mother, you would ha have to pay $100,000. So again, it's money, money that can make uh, life, can make children. I would pick one point of what you say because it was a lot. So <laughs> I'll take like one point, which is this idea that uh, maybe I'm going to, to ask you something because it seems to me that you also, when it, while we were talking, you also make this, different, this difference that, you know, uh, capitalism can make nature better, let's say, which implies uh, that, let's, um, that nature is the before uh, that there is a nature, right, that you could make it better or you could preserve. Uh, that is, nature is something that uh, is non-human. It's, it's, it's non-human, mm. right? That's it's the fantasy. I'm not saying this is right. I'm saying this is the fantasy of biocapitalism. But I didn't want to interrupt you. Hmm? No, because what I understood is that what, you know, what, what I take from what you're saying is that, let's say, capitalism is going to say, well, I'm going to produce a better nature. And this idea of producing nature would be something that is uh, morally already uh, problematic, this idea of producing a new nature. Through your research about this, well, we're going to produce a new body. So this would be uh, already morally uh, problematically. So this, this would be a question to you based on something that recently uh, I, I am also been uh, reading about, which is new archaeological uh, excavations in the Amazon, uh, huge sites which have been recently discovered that say that in fact the Amazon, Amazonia is anthropogenic that uh, the, the quintessential uh, image of what we thought to be nature, of that which perhaps we could never produce, that's what I'm saying, the idea of producing mm -hmm. a nature uh, that, you know, that we should preserve, it's in fact anthropogenic. And actually, actually the, the most biodiverse parts of the forest are said to be anthropogenic. So the discussion uh, around ecologists, archaeologists, some disagree on this, because some disagree and say, in fact, the Amazon could never, uh, doesn't have the capacity to uh, host complex societies, just the kind of micro-tribes uh, which we think that uh, populate the Amazon, mm -hmm. but in mm -hmm. fact, there's some other other mm -hmm. People inside the debate are saying the opposite. In, flag, in fact, the Amazon is populated by complex societies. So the guys on the one hand, they say, well, if you say this, that the Amazon, the Amazonia is anthropogenic, what you are stimulating is in fact this vision of capitalism that we can produce nature. So it doesn't matter, we can produce it again. We did once, so we can produce it again. So some of the people who want to conserve the Amazon say, well, this is bad archaeology because you are stimulating a certain type of view uh, which is in fact destructive because you are saying this was created by humans. Now, so this, this kind of complicated the situation in relation both to nature or to the nature of life itself because there is a level of, of production uh, which I felt in your last talk, had a, you, you have a certain problem with this idea of, uh, of uh, interfering uh, to a certain level in what is 
natural. Uh, I think this idea of yours is very, very interesting. That the Amazon, which is really considered the big nature uh, symbol for for uh, today, should be anthropogenic. Uh, I believe you. I, I have no reason. I am not an archaeologist of of the Amazon, and I couldn't uh, couldn't say anything. I think uh, most of Europe, anyway, is anthropogenic, and most of Africa probably is uh, is too. So okay. So we say biocapitalism. Biocapitalism is the future of uh, of humanity. It's okay. I'm not making any moral statements. I'm not saying this is good or this is bad. We can just say we 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 uh, consider this uh, a fact. But where do we go from there? Where do we go? It's it's complicated, but. Well, I think you know um, it's interesting because you are talking about biocapitalism or biopolitics. Foucault, no, he's kind of more or less identifying the birth of biopolitics with, which overlaps with the mm. Anthropocene, mm. Mm. right? It, which also overlaps with the Great Enclosures. Mm. So it's it's this massive introduction of the natural world into the systems of government, into the systems of politics, into every level of the organization of society, right? And this is precisely what would be biopolitics. And it's very interesting because um, Foucault uses also a lot of uh, uh, ecological metaphors, right? So uh, he used this concept it's called milieu, right? That the kind of biopolitical space is the environment, is the milieu, the way which you organize flows, the way which you organize flows of grants, for example. Uh, uh. And and I don't see in this, uh, let's say, a priori a problem. Actually, uh, I think uh, we should take this that, you know, in fact, everything, every part of life has become a question of power. Now, the question is that uh, considering this, what type of, let's say, political ecology should we take into consideration in order to direct a certain form of uh, production of life as that which is uh, uh, the outcome of power in a certain way. So what forms of power should we uh, uh, organize or, or, or political systems in which it, that we, we are going to produce a certain type of nature? So a priori, I, I wouldn't have, let's say, a problem with uh, uh, the incorporation of this into our legal or political systems, but rather the opposite, I would say that we have to, to, to say this and, 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 and then move forward in a certain way. And I think this idea of, of uh, biopolitics is very much what those people who passed the constitution in Ecuador are saying, you know, if it's biopolitics, uh, if you know life has entered into the systems of power, so let's protect in some ways uh, what is life, and in that sense, uh, a, a nature. And the discourse, if, if, you, if you talk to activists, if you talk to people that are involved in those movements, uh, 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 they very much have a kind of biopolitical discourse. It's, it's kind of impressive because they say we are fighting for life in a certain way, almost like life as uh, the species in a certain way, or interspecies. And just to connect with uh, the idea that we're discussing, uh, yesterday with uh, Depeche that uh, in his text, he wrote a text in which he says, well, maybe in an anthropocenic moment, uh, our new political subjectivity has to be conscious of the species as a kind of political subject. That is to say, uh, we have, uh, beyond the human, we have to think as a species and our relation with other species. Right? That is to say, somehow an ethics of life in a, in a, in a political sense. And I think uh, those movements that are somehow try in a certain way, that there is of course lots of critiques about this idea of, well, you know, nature has rights, it's kind of problematic, people don't know what this means, you know, it kind of, uh, we don't know how to articulate, how to use this. But I think uh, at least this shows a certain type of attempt to take this biopolitical present in which we live, 
and kind of turn this upside down mm. in a certain way and redefine, let's say, the epistemic frames in which we frame life itself. Yeah, I glaube, dass man diesen Begriff des Lebens. Uh, I think we have to look um, more closer at the term life. Life here, the Greeks do differentiate it between zoan and bios. Life can be an individual life, yours or mine, but life can be life in general on our planet Earth. So it um, can also be a very general term. So what could happen now, and that is why I was mentioning biocapitalism, what could happen is that humans themselves make themselves <coughs> superfluous in this definition of life, that there is life, but humans are no longer needed there. And th there's another term, life, uh, in a different meaning, the meaning of general life. But human beings who always felt themselves the masters of life and objective nature. At the same time, humans now become superfluous and become a mere product of money. And that's a difference to the anthropogenic Amazonas uh, area.